It would help if I turned it on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very good. Well, welcome. Wonderful to see you all this evening. I know so a few more folks are going to be streaming in, but in the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and get started. So welcome, and thank you for coming to the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center's Fall Community Conversation, focusing on new treatment options for Alzheimer's disease. I'm Dr. Art Wallacek, this evening's host. Uh, I'm a geriatric psychiatrist at the UW Department of Psychiatry, and I am the co-core leader of the Outreach, Recruitment, and Engagement Core. And this is one of our classic activities of the OR Core at the ADRC, our fall community event. And so we're delighted that you could join us here again for this ongoing tradition. Tonight, we will hear about what new treatment options for Alzheimer's disease are available, who's eligible to receive those treatments, what the risks are, where and when someone can get the treatment, and then known associated costs, risks, and more. I want to take a moment to thank our volunteers. So we have many folks here from the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Center helping us out tonight. And I also want to thank our premier sponsor, Vista West, a Capri community who helped make this event possible. Their support assists us in bringing important education about Alzheimer's disease to our community. I hope that you had time to wander through the resource fair and maybe grab a quick bite to eat before you came in. It was generously co-sponsored by Dementia Friendly Middleton and West Madison. We want to thank our exhibitors for participating this evening and contributing to our community's health through the vital work they do. Okay, you should have each received a red bag. Y'all have red, I see lots of red bags. Okay, excellent. So dig into your bag and you're gonna find some good stuff. So yellow paper evaluation form. So this is an evaluation form that we're gonna be collecting at the end of the program. We encourage you to fill this out. So I'm an educator, this is an educational event. We wanna hear your feedback about how this went, whether this was effective for you or not, and ideas for next year as well. So thank you in advance for your feedback. We are the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. We conduct research, and that depends on folks like you. It depends on our research participants to allow us to advance our knowledge of Alzheimer's disease. So if you are interested in participating in research, look in that handy red bag. There is a pamphlet. It's called In Search for a Solution. This brochure gives an overview of what we're currently working on at the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. If you'd like extra brochures to share with your friends and family, we'll have some on a table just outside this room for you to pick up on your way out. Now, what we're going to do today is we're going to have a presentation, a couple presentations, panel discussion, and then we're going to open up things for Q&A. So if you have questions, there's something else in your red bag, index cards. So pull out one of these index cards, write down your question. We're going to have folks going around the audience, so just kind of raise your hand up if you've got a question on an index card. We're gonna have our volunteer staff picking these up and then sorting through them and then bringing them up front for us to be able to answer these questions. So we look forward to that interactive part of our evening. This event is being recorded and you'll be able to watch the recording on our YouTube channel, note in the program. Just a housekeeping matter before we get started here, this will be a terrific time to silence or turn off your cell phones. Uh, thank you in advance for doing that. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Sanjay Astana. I'm delighted and honored to introduce him and welcome him today. He is the founding director of the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. He's an associate dean of gerontology at the UW School of Medicine and Public Health and holds a number of other local and national leadership positions. <laughs> He also sees patients at the UW Health Memory Assessment Clinic, specializing in assessing and diagnosing patients with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Please help me welcome Dr. Sanjay Asan. Thank you, Dr. Wallazak, for that kind introduction. Good evening. How are you all doing? <laughs> Wonderful. Great to see you all. And we are really excited to share with you the excitement that we have uh, about the first disease-modifying treatment approved by the FDA for Alzheimer's disease. I cannot tell you it took us decades as scientists to reach this level. And this is a breakthrough moment in Alzheimer's research. The result is now we can treat 
uh, Alzheimer's disease. So what we plan to do today, whole of the meeting, you're going to hear all about these new, newly approved treatments for Alzheimer's disease. And what my role is to share with you a very brief summary of the UW Alzheimer's program, the exciting work, the breakthrough work that goes on here. Um, and you know, some people say I like to brag, but we are indeed one of the world-renowned centers in Alzheimer's research. So we'll come to the first slide, please. So just a, just a reminder that Alzheimer's disease is very prevalent. In the United States alone right now, we have about 6.3, 6.7 million Americans with this disease, and there are many more who are undiagnosed. So this is really an, an underestimate of the prevalence of Alzheimer's in the US. Uh, and the prediction, the projections are that unless we find very effective treatments, although some treatments have come through, uh, and prevention strategies, there'll be about 14 million Americans by about 2050. Uh, so, but the hope is that that really will not reach there because there are so many advances taking place in the therapeutic area in Alzheimer's. In Wisconsin, we have about 120,000 Wisconsinites with this disease right now, and in about two years, just in two years, there'll be another 10,000 Wisconsin residents who will be diagnosed with the disease. So this is a very prevalent disease. And it is the seventh most leading cause of death in the United States, it used to be six, but in the last two or three years, COVID took over as the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. But that number is going to improve with the, with the invention of the vaccines and treatment. So Alzheimer's right now is the seventh leading cause of death in the United States. Next slide, please. So on the slide here, you see uh, a map of the US with a number of centers across the country. These centers are NIH-funded centers of excellence in Alzheimer's disease. There are 37 centers. You see that the, the Rocky Mountain area, there's no center, that, that is one part of the country where people have to travel to uh, long distances to go to, especially to see someone, if someone has Alzheimer's. Uh, the Wisconsin ADRC was funded in 2009 by NIH, so we are very fortunate. We have been funded all the way for the last 14 years by the NIH, and we sincerely hope we have an application in as we talk, that about November, December, we'll hear hopefully the good news that NIH is planning to keep us funded for another five years, which will take us through 2029. The, uh, the, the center here has 33 scientists. They are spread all over the UW campus. They have expertise in all aspects of neuroscience and Alzheimer's research. And there are additional 79 affiliate scientists with the ADRC. And we have about 100 and over uh, employee staff and faculty who work for the center. So it's a very large center. Next slide, please. So the center is complex and large. It has many components. Uh, it has what we call as eight cores. These are core programs of the center and something known as the research education component. It'll take me probably whole of the evening to describe in detail each core, but I don't plan to do that. So very, very briefly, the administrative core, uh, the administrative core, as you can imagine, really oversees the administration of this very large center. The next core is the clinical core. The clinical core is led by Dr. Cynthia Carlson. You're gonna hear from her momentarily. Um, and in the clinical core, there are over 1,100 research participants who are enrolled in multiple studies, about more than 50 studies that the ADRC sponsors at any time, active studies. So these 1,100 people participate in those studies. They come either once a year or every other year, and they give us extensive research data that we use here, and we share it worldwide so that we can help uh, uh, advance the Alzheimer's research across the globe. The next core is core is the data management and statistical core. Uh, this is led by Dr. Richard Chappelle, who uh, actually oversees the uh, make sure that all the data we collect is safe, that it is analyzed properly, and again we publish papers once these data are analyzed. The next one is the neuropathology core. What this core does, it performs autopsies on the brains that are donated by participants who are enrolled in the Wisconsin ADRC. Currently about 66% of participants in our ADRC have donated their brain, they've agreed to donate the brain. And then at this core, uh, led by Dr. Sharia Salamat locally and nationally, Dr. Tom Montine at, at Stanford University and Dirk Keen at University of Washington, they all team up with us 
and they do autopsies and also uh, the tissue is then uh, shared worldwide with scientists. Uh, the next core is the Outreach, Recruitment, and Engagement Core, which is led by Dr. Dorothy Edwards. What this does, it helps us recruit participants from across Wisconsin, and it also holds a number of community-based outreach educational events. Probably some of you have attended some of those uh, events. I mean, this event here, uh, they have been uh, a part uh, of, of the organizing committee. Um, and they discuss the latest in Alzheimer's research and also share with you the benefits of being a part of a research study. The next core is the inclusion of underrepresented minority, uh, underrepresented groups core. This is led by Dr. Kerry Gleason. Uh, this core really helps us understand disparities in Alzheimer's research. It also helps us understand how the disease differs between different races and ethnicities. And I'm very proud to share with you that the Wisconsin ADRC supports two of the largest cohorts of African American and Native American participants who, who have provided data so that we better understand how the disease differs in different races and ethnicities. The next score is deeper. Thank you. Thank you. And this is critical because this is how we will generalize the result, right? The disease behaves differently in different races and ethnicities, and you'll hear uh, hopefully in the discussion today. The next score is the biomarker core. Uh, this is uh, really uh, world-renowned, led by Dr. Sterling Johnson. Hopefully he's here. Sterling, raise your hands. Are you, are you here? Yes, Sterling, oh, there are you. So Dr. Dr. Johnson oversees a large core where uh, they assess the various biomarkers, markers of the disease. When someone has no symptoms, they do all kinds of MRI scans, pet brain scans. They collect CSF and analyze the spinal fluid for various biomarkers of the, of the disease, um, and, and they also examine the blood uh, to, to have some biomarker tests. Imagine a day, which may not be that far from now, where you go to your doctor's office, they'll take your blood and tell you if you have Alzheimer's proteins or not. That day is very, very close, and a major accomplishment from you know, all the research from the center is contributing to that breakthrough research. Direct education, the research education component is led by Dr. Barb Benlin, and they're training the next generation of scientists who will stay here and probably grow across the country and beyond uh, to, to conduct Alzheimer's research. And finally, the care research core is led by Dr. Amy Kind. Uh, this core is conducting st state-of-the-art research uh, to better understand how we can treat people who still have the disease. Um, and this is really a first core of its kind within the national ADRC network of 37 centers. Next slide, please. I'll go fast because I know I, I was just given about six minutes to describe for you 14 years of research. How about that? <laughs> Maybe I'll take another hour, right? All right. This is the, the two uh, pillars of our Alzheimer's research program here are the ADRC and the WAI, the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute. The ADRC, as I mentioned, is one of the 37 centers of excellence here in Alzheimer's research funded by the NIH, and it dominantly conducts research across the full spectrum of Alzheimer's, like uh, right from lab-based molecular research to clinical research to community-based research, and also then we disseminate and publish our findings worldwide. We have published almost 1,000 papers in the last 14 years since the center was established. And the funding for ADRC comes from NIH, dominantly NIH, and also the university, the medical school, the state of Wisconsin legislature, um, and also uh, philanth philanthropic donations are that many of you have donated to the program, and those dollars are pivotal for us to do breakthrough research. The Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute is led by Dr. Cynthia Carlson, and it focuses on clinical education, public health, outreach, and it also supports the world-renowned RAP study, uh, which you'll hear about. It employs over 30 people, and it, again, it is funded by the NIH, the, the University, State of Wisconsin, and philanthropic donations. Next slide, please. So in the ADRC, I mentioned earlier, we have over 1,100 participants, and some of them have Alzheimer's disease, the others have a diagnosis of MCI, uh, and many others are cognitively normal, but at least one of their parents has the disease, so they are at risk for the disease, and they they contribute uh, and help us generate breakthrough research data. And also a number of caregivers are working with us to help us understand how we can reduce caregiver stress. You know how much of stress is involved in caring for people with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and we, we collect extensive data. The Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute 
uh, sponsors the RAP study. Raise your hands if any one of you is in the RAP study. Oh, there you go. Many of you, you know all about this study, right? So this study is led by Dr. Johnson, and it is world-renowned. And they have over 1,700 people, and you all help us generate really cutting-edge research data. And again, um, the data between the ADRC and the, and the RAP study are harmonized. That is, we can combine, they follow the same protocols. And so we can combine the data from both studies, the ADRC and RAP, and have a much larger data set that we can analyze. Next slide, please. I'm going to skip the next slide because this is all about the newly approved treatments, and you're going to hear throughout the meeting all about these medications. But this is truly a momentous moment for Alzheimer's research when we have disease modifying treatments for the disease. Next slide, please. So I want to share with you uh, a historic moment at UW-Madison. Just last week on Friday, we heard that Dr. Sterling Johnson received a $150 million grant from the NIH. This grant will fund a breakthrough study called Clarity, the one of its kind in the world. Now I'm going to invite Dr. Johnson to come on the stage. He has one minute to talk to you about this study. <laughs> Dr. Johnson, please. While he's walking, to the best of our knowledge, and we may be wrong, but I think we were right, we are right. This is the largest single NIH grant ever awarded to UW-Madison. Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Dr. Asana. I just want to mention that uh, this grant is uh, the collective effort of many people across the country. It's, uh, there's multiple leadership sites across the country. It's leveraging what we've done so well here in Wisconsin, thanks to many of you who've been part of our research. The success that we've had locally, we're now taking nationwide, together with some of the breakthroughs at some of the other centers, and we're taking that nationwide too. We're leveraging all of the amazing infrastructure of the center's program, and now we'll be able to do some unified imaging on top of that so that we can identify the multiple causes of cognitive impairment. We know now, because we've been so good at understanding Alzheimer's disease, that there's other pathology, there's other diseases that often co-occur with Alzheimer's. So that's what we'll be focusing on in this new project so that we can get better treatments, more precise diagnoses, and uh, improve outcomes for our patients. I guess that's, that's the summary, Dr. Asana. We're so fortunate to have scientists like Dr. Johnson. He's got a large team. Um, Clarity involves, will involve all the 37 ADRCs in the United States will, will be a part of this study. It's quite amazing. Next slide, please. And this slide here, just to share with you, uh, as I mentioned, we have over 50 studies ongoing at any one time, but we are always looking for participants to, uh, to enroll into our studies. So anyone who may have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or MCI or has no cognitive symptom but has a family history of Alzheimer's disease, please contact us because we are always looking for participants to, be, uh, to enroll in our studies. And also, there's another project, the ADRC Dementia Care Project. We're looking for a patient and their care partner to enroll together so that we can understand care, care over stress and also what it takes to care for someone with Alzheimer's disease. Next slide, that's my last slide. And, and just to share with you that uh, about uh, two and a half years ago, and uh, Steve Ramick, who's involved with this uh, Madison campaign, Wisconsin Madison campaign, is here. He can answer questions for you. Uh, but UW Madison uh, launched this uh, fundraising program called Wisconsin Medicine Campaign and the Initiative to End Alzheimer's Disease. Um, uh, if anyone of you are interested in donating to the program, every dollar that we get is, is uh, it contributes uh, toward generating new information for Alzheimer's research. Each and every dollar is invested in research, uh, the, the donor dollar, donor. So please consider donating to the program. Um, and I really want to thank you again for being here. Um, and I want to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Cynthia Carlson, 
who will uh, introduce the area of therapeutics to you and the breakthrough research. Dr. Carlson is professor of medicine. She's director of the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute. As I mentioned earlier, she's leader of the clinical core of the ADRC and co-leader of the biomarker core that Dr. Johnson leads. Uh, Dr. Dr. Carlson is a world-renowned scientist and until just a couple of weeks ago, she chaired the National Advisory Council, the Federal uh, Government's Council that advises the NAPA, the National Alzheimer's Project Act, the most prestigious and the senior position in the country, and she was chairing that committee until about two or three weeks ago. Please welcome Dr. Carlson. Thank you. Thank you so much. We really appreciate all of you taking your evening to be with us today and to share in our enthusiasm and our excitement for where we are with treating and diagnosing Alzheimer's disease earlier. So um, I just want to thank you for being here. So again, my name is Cindy Carlson. I'm a geriatrician. I see patients at the Veterans Hospital and at a weekly basis and also do research with our Alzheimer's Center and through the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute. And today what I'll be doing is to set the stage so to kind of get us all on the same page with terms that we use to describe the new therapies and um, to describe what we typically do in a clinic right now and what we hope to see happening in clinics down the road. So next slide. So these are my disclosures, just so we're transparent. Again, most of our studies are funded by the National Institutes of Eight, um, National Institute on Aging and the VA, but also some of the companies help support NIH in those studies. Next slide. So as Dr. Slana mentioned, over the next coming decades, it's anticipated that, pe that more and more people will develop dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. And part of why this is happening is you can see by the black line, which shows the total number of people who will be developing Alzheimer's disease most of that's driven because we're living longer, which is a good thing. But we know that age is a risk factor for developing dementia. But what we can do now, what we're hoping, is that these predictions will be wrong by trying to do, by looking at these new therapies that we have, by identifying the disease earlier, and by trying to prevent the disease from starting. So this is what our, we've been working toward. I think during COVID, we got used to the term flatten the curve. We want to flatten that curve and slow down the development of Alzheimer's. Next slide. So these are some of the risk factors that we know about for Alzheimer's disease. So some of them we can't change. So for example, aging. We don't know all the details about why aging increases our risk, but it does. There are genetic risk factors, including one called apolipoprotein E4 allele. So it's a long word, we call it APOE4 for short. Um, and so that's one of the risk factors we look for. But the encouraging news is that there are a lot of risk factors um, that can, we can do something about that are modifiable. So things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, activity. So you didn't realize that's why we had you park so far away in those <laughs> parking lots is to increase your step count for today. Um, but these are things we can do something about. And even though we're talking through breakthrough therapies tonight, again, we need to make sure that we're not ignoring these other things we can do for our health as well. So in our program, we try to study holistically, not just the exciting breakthrough therapies, but also lifestyle factors and other things that controlling our blood vessel risk factors that can make a difference in our risk for Alzheimer's. Next slide. So this is what we do. Um, this is how we currently define if somebody has a diagnosis of dementia. And so we're going to clarify, I get questions every day, including um, today in clinic, what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? So dementia is a term that's defined by a person having some thinking abilities that affect their, that have been changing from what their baseline is and those thinking abilities affect their day-to-day -day function. So those changes. And so it can't be in the context of somebody having a medical illness. So if I'm in the hospital with a pneumonia and haven't slept because I've been coughing for three days, you don't want to say I have a dementia. 
I'm probably just sleep deprived and um, feeling sick, and so my thinking abilities probably aren't as sharp as they were usually. But again, if somebody doesn't have a medical illness or a psychiatric illness, their thinking abilities have changed, and by thinking abilities, we define it by different types of thinking abilities. So memory is one we usually think about, but we also can have problems with language, how quickly we think, our behavior, um, how well we can picture where things are in space. So there's a lot of different thinking abilities that we, we look at. So if you look at these, again, this is how we define if somebody has a dementia. So there's no brain scans up there or special blood tests or anything. This is what we see in the person, and the person sitting in front of us. It, it takes a little time to get to know that person, what they're about, what their baseline thinking abilities were, what their strengths and weaknesses were. Um, so this is how we define dementia. Next slide. In the clinic setting, when someone comes to us and we're trying to see if they have dementia, we then take it a step further and we say, well, let's see what's causing that dementia. And so what we do then is we look through, we'll do a physical exam, we'll look at some blood tests to look at, again, this is how we're doing things now, to look and make sure it's not something else, like low thyroid or high thyroid, that it's not a vitamin deficiency, that's not an infection. Um, we'll look with a brain scan, which I'll show next. We look at brain scans to make sure there's no strokes. And then we'll provide some education and feedback, plug people in with resources. But again, what we do is chiefly to rule out other things. So again, other medical problems. Next slide. So when we do a brain scan in clinic, as of what our, what our clinical practice is right now, so if you go into the doctor and see someone for memory problems, they'll usually either order an MRI scan or a CAT scan, or called CT scan. And what those types of imaging show, those can show if you have a tumor, if there's a stroke, if there's small blood vessel changes throughout the brain, but it doesn't show you if you have Alzheimer's disease. It can show you if there's shrinkage patterns, and shrinkage suggests that there's been some um, damage to the brain over time. Um, they, it can show you, again, the strokes, but it's not gonna show you if you do have Alzheimer's, just if you, you know, make sure you don't have something else, like a tumor, stroke, et cetera. Next slide. And that's important because, again, we're seeing this person in clinic, trying to look and see who they are as a person, what changes they've noticed, we're ruling out other things, the thyroid problems. But again, there's a lot of different causes of dementia. So this is where we get to the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's. Dementia is what we see in the person. Alzheimer's are the brain changes, the protein buildups that cause that dementia. But you can see there's a lot of different causes. So Alzheimer's is shown in the pie graph with the AD. That causes a lot of the types of dementias that we see. That's the most common type. But as Dr. Johnson mentioned too, there's a lot of other types of dementias and commonly they'll occur with Alzheimer's brain changes. So in clinic, I can't really tell. I can, I can look at a person, talk to them, hear their symptoms, and try to guess which of these dementias it is. But we really need specific tests so we can tell which type of dementia is it so that we can give people the right therapies. Because there are other types, like Lewy body dementia is caused by a different type of protein buildup. There's vascular dementia caused by strokes, Parkinson's disease dementia, which is similar to Lewy body. And there's even a new one we didn't even know about until recent years that's called, um, it's a long word, which is why they call it late. So limbic predominant age associated TDP 43 encephalopathy. And so that's in your quiz at the end of tonight. But what it really just breaks down to limbic predominant is where it occurs. Age-related means it's common as we get older. TDP43 is the type of protein that builds up. And encephalopathy just means brain disease. So it's just a lot of, but anyway, late. So it's a new kind of change. And that looks a lot like Alzheimer's disease in the person. Next slide. So this is a picture of my grandmother who, um, when I was in high school, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's dementia. That's why I'm here today as a geriatrician and dementia researcher. 
Looking back, I think she probably had a different type, probably had frontotemporal dementia. But again, the, there were no blood tests then, there were no special scans to be able to identify what is the underlying cause of her dementia. But so again, what we see in the person is going to be the clinical syndrome or the dementia, but then we have to figure out what's going on in the brain. So let's go to the next slide. With Alzheimer's disease, if you look at these pictures on the slide, on the left-hand side is a picture of a normal brain, and it's a kind of a shot right through the brain as if you're looking straight on at the brain. The top is a picture of what you're seeing in the MRI scan below. So those fluid spaces, those are normal. This is where some spinal fluid is. But you can see the brain is nice and plump and healthy. Um, these, these structures here are called hippocamp the hippocampus, and they're nice and full in this picture. And if you look at the nerve cells up close, the nerve cells or neurons are healthy, and there's no protein buildups between the nerve cells. On this side, we see Alzheimer's changes. And you can see that the brain has shrunken in this person. You can see this on the MRI as well. These hippocampus that are here, which are really important for memory and learning, are shrunken as well. And if you look up close under a microscope, there is buildup of this protein to make up these plaques. It's called amyloid plaques. Anytime we use the term plaques in medicine, it usually refers to like a sticky deposit. So we can have plaques in our arteries, plaques on our teeth. These in particular are amyloid plaques, so sticky deposits of this protein amyloid, and we're going to come back to that amyloid. And then inside the nerve cells, or the neurons, you get a buildup of these proteins called tau, um, which cause the nerve cell to become damaged and not function, and then you get this wave of shrinkage of the brain as the nerve cells get damaged and die. Next slide. So if you look at a, a graph over time, you can see that, again, for normal aging, we expect it'll take us a little longer to learn new information or to remember things, but we're still functioning okay. In mild cognitive impairment, we may start having memory changes, learning changes that show up on thinking tests, but we're compensating. We're using lists, we're using our GPS, we're putting sticky notes, reminders, asking our family to remind us. We're still making, we're still getting done what we need to get done. If we get to the point where it's dementia, it means that our function has changed. We get lost even when we use GPS. We forget appointments even with reminders. Um, we can't get what we need to from the grocery store because even with lists, we forget to use the list. And over time, you have these brain changes that have been accumulating these plaques and tangles. Next. So currently, we have treatments that if we start them here, you can see that we've already had, some, the person's already had symptoms for a while, and they've already had these brain changes that have probably been developing over decades. So when we start our therapies currently, it does slow down the progression, but again, it's not where we'd like to be. We'd like to be back up to where we started. Next slide. So if we look up close at how our medicines are working currently, so I want you to focus on this section over here on the far right. Um, you can see if you look up close in the brain, if you can advance, Kaylin, um, what the medicines do that we have available now, they help this chemical communicate across these nerve cells. But it doesn't really get rid of, next slide, it doesn't really do anything to those plaques and tangles that are building up. So it helps the nerve cells communicate, but it's not really getting rid of the underlying damage. Next slide. So um, again, with the FDA treatments for Alzheimer's disease, we have these medicines that help um, improve chemical signals. So again, denepazil, rabastigmine, um, galantamine, these are all ones that we use in practice. There's a different one called Nemenda, or NMDA antagonist, that also helps in a similar process. So these are the pill forms of medicines we have currently. Next slide. But now we're at a new era for Alzheimer's disease diagnosis and therapy, which we're really excited to share with you today. Next slide. So now, instead of just having CAT scans and MRI scans that rule out um, the other things that could cause memory problems, we actually have scans and blood tests and spinal fluid tests that tell us if it's Alzheimer's or not. So again, um, we have spinal fluid tests probably developed first along with these PET scans 
And then now we're on the verge of having blood tests become more widely available to tell us, do we have buildup of this amyloid? So you can see in this scan here, the red areas and warm colors show where there's amyloid buildup. This is looking down from on top of the person's head. Um, and then on the left-hand side, this person has low levels of amyloid. So again, now we can see in a living person, do they have elevated amyloid or not? Next slide. And so you can see on this slide that Dr. Johnson shared, um, you can see we can now identify amyloid. So these are the plaques in somebody, that's all the red areas. And again, this is a different picture looking kind of straight on at the person's head. This is a separate type of brain imaging called tau. In the new study that Dr. Johnson mentioned, will measure amyloid and tau in individuals. And then this is a, an MRI, which is fairly normal. Next slide. But what's interesting is that this is a person who does not have any memory problems. Their thinking abilities have changed over time, but they're still in the normal range. So again, we can pick up these changes before people develop any memory symptoms, which is amazing. Next slide. So now, instead of waiting until we get symptoms, you can advance. We really want to try to get new preventive therapies that, again, target earliest, earliest possible symptoms, and even more so, you can advance again, try to get these earliest brain changes before we get any memory loss symptoms. And we're really at that cusp, and so it's so exciting to be able to share some of these exciting advances with you today. Next slide. So now I'm going to go over some of the studies that have generated a lot of our excitement. And again, these studies, I really want to thank all the participants who were a part of these groundbreaking studies, the investigators. This is really a team effort. And so that's one thing we're really thankful for at our center. As Dr. Asana mentioned, we have a huge team. But again, that team also includes numerous thousands and thousands of research participants who help make this kind of exciting findings possible. So this was the first study that came out um, back last, or about a year or two ago. And what they found that there is a therapy called, um, up here, the aducanumab, I had one patient called abracadabra, abracadabra medicine. Um, so aducanumab was given, it's a medicine through the veins to see if it improves, it reduces amyloid and improves thinking abilities. And this one was controversial because as you can see on the picture here on the left, those who got the, the aducanumab, either low or high dose, it did lower the amyloid. So yes, it lowered the amyloid in their brain compared to those who got the placebo or the saline infl infusions. However, when they looked at, there are kind of two studies, one was called Engage, one was called Emerge. When you looked at the doses of the medicines and whether it helped people's thinking abilities, it was one study didn't even show it helped people's thinking abilities at all, and the other one showed only in the high dose group. So again, there was excitement about it, but still not great results. Next slide. So then this last year, we were very excited when the, the results from lecanemab came out. And these, th this study showed, does it reduce amyloid in the brain? Yes. So it was an 18-month study. You can see here this drop in this green line shows the decline in amyloid by the end of the study. Next slide. And what's even more important is that you can see that the green line, compared to the black, that the green line showed that there was a delay in progression of symptoms in people who were on the anti-amyloid therapy. So again, these therapies now are going in, clearing out that amyloid, and in this case, actually improving symptoms. But what we're seeing, too, is that these people are not staying up where we'd like them to be, but it's a delay in progression. So it's, we're still not there yet, but it is helping on top of the other medicines like denepazil, et cetera. Next slide. There's a newer therapy, too, that's been in the news called denanumab. Does it lower amyloid? It does. It's another therapy. These are all through the veins, unfortunately, though. So again, these are medicines you'd have to go into a clinic and get infused. So it lowers amyloid, and next slide. And similarly, it delays decline in thinking abilities. So these are encouraging findings. We have not only the pills, but also now these IV infusions that actually target the underlying cause of the disease. 
Um, and so it actually improves thinking abilities, um, quality of life, etc. Next slide. But there are some side effects. So in the study, they monitor closely with MRI scans, and there's some people who developed a little bit of swelling in the brain called, and it's called amyloid-related imaging abnormalities, or ARIA. And if it's an E, it means there's a little edema, just swelling in the brain. If it's an H, it means there is some hemorrhage or little microbleeds in the brain. So the areas of white here are some swelling or edema. In these areas that show some of these darker spots are some microbleeds. Most of the time, people did not have symptoms, and they just found it on the brain scan, but sometimes people did have symptoms. Next slide. And there are a lot of unanswered questions still. So for example, um, these studies did not have very many people from underrepresented backgrounds. So we know that African Americans and persons from Hispanic or Latinx background, they have higher vascular risk factors and other factors that impact their brain health. And they didn't include them in the study. So we don't know, does it help all people? And that's why our studies are trying to enroll people from more diverse backgrounds. We also don't know, what about persons with Down syndrome? Um, Down syndrome for, um, adults are very high, very high risk for developing Alzheimer's disease, but they weren't included in these studies. How long do we treat patients with this? The study was 18 months. Do we keep treating them after that, or do we stop? How do we know if it comes back, if we have to retreat them? What's a clinically meaningful improvement? So if somebody's progression is slowed down, um, what does that mean for the person? Does living with this disease nine more months at that level, is that meaningful to them? So there's a lot of discussion still on how do we best implement this, how do we best uh, understand the best way we can use this medication appropriately. Next slide. And so how do we go about getting these therapies? So in our discussion, we'll talk some more, but a lot of healthcare systems now are setting up um, specialized memory clinics or setting up how to refer people to those. They'll get some genetic testing to see if you're at risk for some of those side effects that I mentioned. They will also um, have special infusion clinics, have to get special MRI monitoring done, and make sure that people are not on blood thinners, um, some strong blood thinners, which can increase risk for some of the adverse effects. So there's some processes set up, and we'll hear some more about that in our discussion. Next slide. This slide is just to show you there's a lot. This is a slide that comes out every year. It shows that there's a lot of medications in the pipeline, which is exciting. So the, all these dots represent different types of therapies they're studying, not just amyloid ones, but tau and other kinds of therapies. So that's the exciting part. These are all coming. Next slide. So again, Dr. Stana mentioned our research program. Next slide. And again, Alzheimer's is more common as we age. Um, we're having new therapies now where we can tell if it's Alzheimer's or it's not, but we can't yet tell what else it is if it's not Alzheimer's. So again, that's the work Dr. Johnson mentioned will be done. And we have new therapies now that target um, anti-amyloid therapy, so that target the underlying cause of Alzheimer's. We'll stop there and move on to our moderator and our panel discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Carlson. That's, uh, that was a really masterful summary of a lot of very complicated information. So thank you, and it's going to set us up well for our panel discussion, which is what we're doing next. So I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming two more guests tonight. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Shaniqua Bogues and Dr. Jack Temple. Dr. Bogues is a memory care geriatrician and faculty member in the Division of Geriatrics and Gerontology within the Department of Medicine. She specializes in memory assessments, dementia, and geriatric medicine. Dr. Bogues' research interests include the impact of metabolic syndrome risk factors on cognition, assessing trust in medical researchers, and an individual's willingness to participate in research studies with community engagement approaches. Her ultimate goal is to find alternative recruitment strategies to increase the participation of underrepresented populations in dementia research studies, and that's something we'll be talking about in our panel discussion as well. So welcome, Dr. Bogues.
And I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Jack Temple. He is the Senior Director of Pharmacy at UW Health and Associate Clinical Professor at the UW School of Pharmacy. He's an expert in using automation and technology and has successfully implemented strategies that have enhanced the efficiency and effectiveness of pharmacy services. In an ever-evolving landscape, Dr. Temple has implemented innovative solutions that drive patient safety and satisfaction by developing new clinical programs, advances in medication therapy management, which we're going to be hearing about, and adopting technology-driven initiatives. I could say in just a five-minute chat with Dr. Temple right before this started, I learned a bunch of new information. So uh, you're all in for a treat in terms of learning from a pharmacist about how this process works. So, Welcome, Dr. Temple. Okay, so bear with us. So we're trying something new here. So we're doing, we're doing a conversation. So we're sitting among several ferns on these comfy chairs. So we're trying to uh, have a more conversational style here. So I'm gonna go through some questions that actually many of you submitted uh, as part of the registration process. We're gonna do that for about the next 30 minutes or so, and then we will switch over to your questions that have just come up. So again, look in those red bags. If you have questions, please pull out one of those index cards, write it down, put your hand up, and we will come by and collect those. So, all right, well, welcome panelists. Great to have you up here. Excited to, to begin this discussion with you. Dr. Carlson, um, so as you mentioned, the FDA approved lecanemab for patients with mild cognitive impairment, MCI, or mild dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. So kind of two specific phases of Alzheimer's disease. What treatments are available for people with moderate to severe dementia, kind of later stages? And uh, parallel to that, what about folks who develop Alzheimer's earlier on, early onset dementia before age 65? Those are great questions. Um, again, we do have medicines that have been approved by the FDA to treat people in moderate and later stages, and those are the ones that I mentioned, the denepazil, galantamine, um, rapistigmine, and then the one, nemenda, or romantine is the other name it goes by, that one is also approved for later stages of dementia. There are some, and I'm using the term dementia, because it can, some of those can be used in Alzheimer's dementia, some can be used in vascular dementia or mixed. Um, they have different FDA indications um, based on what studies were done and what stages, but again, there are some treatment options. Um, but in addition, again, many things that we talk with caregivers about, getting a good structure at home, making sure someone's sleeping well, making sure that someone's not on medicines that have negative effects, there's a lot of things we can do to help give a person structure, help their thinking and functional ability, even separately from these medications. Early onset Alzheimer's disease, um, or young onset Alzheimer's disease, has, tends to have a, a little bit faster course, and so some of these medications, again, could be used in persons with young onset Alzheimer's, and again, exploring with the person's provider whether they'd be eligible for these new therapies like lecanemab would be appropriate in, in some of those cases as well. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Poe, so uh, we heard a, a little bit earlier about kind of we don't know quite as much about these conditions or, or about these treatments rather in underserved populations. Can you tell us, you know, as the U.S. becomes increasingly diverse, we of course want we want to make sure that medical care is available to everyone who's affected with dementia. What do we know about the risk of dementia in Black, Hispanic, Native American, older adults? Great question. Well, we do know that African Americans, the Blacks, Hispanics, as well as Native Americans are impacted by Alzheimer's disease and other dementias at a greater risk, at a greater rate than non-Hispanic whites. Blacks tend to have twice uh, the risk of non-Hispanic whites, with Hispanics being at one and a half times that risk. And then as they find new information out about American Indians or Alaska Natives, um, they're finding out that their risk is just as great as blacks um, because they're starting to live longer. Thank you. I guess maybe we'll follow up on that. So uh, 
what are you aware of? And I'd be, I'd be curious, Dr. Carlson, to hear your thoughts on this as well, kind of future studies, where are we at in terms of ensuring that we're including representative populations in those studies so that our research findings clearly apply to everyone in the U.S. who has dementia? Great question as well. That's definitely a huge concern because with those new clinical trials is less representation of diverse participants. With the aducanumab, it was 1% of blacks in that study, only one American Indian participant, one uh, native Hawaiian participant, and they don't have demographics for Hispanics in that study. And then with lacanumab clinical trial, it was 3% blacks. A little increase, but still not enough representation. Um, they didn't have any data on American Indians or Alaska Natives, and you had 12% Hispanics in that study. In regards to where we're moving forward from here, um, thankfully, Dr. Carlson is our PI for the head clinical trial, where they have a supplemental award that's focusing on trying to increase diversity in that clinical trial. And so trying to aim for at least 30% of diverse participants being um, enrolled in that study and trying to screen, uh, enroll at least 15% in that uh, particular trial. And then also we have Dr. Car Dr. Gleason's underrepresented core where she's doing a great job of increase in diversity in the studies. And then for the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center in general, their increase in diversity even in the research staff because that's important when going out to the community as well where you see good representation in the, in the department or division. Thank you. That was very comprehensive. Appreciate that. Dr. Carlson, thank you. Um, again, Dr. Bogues and Dr. James, who's in the front there, would have her wave there. Um, really, Dr. Bogues and Dr. James are spearheading our program's efforts in trying to help us change how we do research so that research is more inclusive and helps people to feel comfortable in those settings. Because as a clinician, if I have a patient who comes into my practice, an African-American man with high blood pressure, family history of strokes in the past, and is wondering about getting lecanemab, I don't have good information from the studies to be able to tell him if it's safe for him to use these medicines. We really need good studies that show us information so that we can say to our different patients who come in our door, yes, this is safe for you, or no, it's probably not safe for you. So thank you both for leading those efforts. Thank you. All right, we're going to get a little bit to brass tacks now about, about the medications. So we, we've heard about aducanumab, lecanumab, denanumab is coming. Dr. Temple, when can we get it? When, when can we actually start getting, let, let's say, lecanumab or lecanumab? When does that happen? Yeah, thanks, Art. Uh, lecanumab, you know, as, as the FDA approval occurred here in July, is, it is available in the marketplace for healthcare systems or infusion centers or physician offices to, to purchase and, and administer to patients. Um, as Dr. Carlson said, there are a number of things uh, ahead of, you know, the actual infusion that you're going to get every two weeks and the 18 months that may come with that treatment that uh, need to be put in place to make sure, you know, patients are uh, eligible for treatment, um, they don't have any um, uh, contraindications or other medications that they may be taking. So a lot of screening that goes into that. Uh, another thing too, you know, given the, the cost of some of these therapies and a lot of our patients are, are covered by Medicare and uh, Medicare has, has come out after the approval and said that they're going to cover only 80% of the cost. So there are other, you know, elements around the 20% of coinsurance that um, need to be screened and make sure that uh, patients are comfortable um, with the ability to be able to, to continue that therapy as, as they start. So a number of those things get put in place, um, gives us some lead time of, of trying to get things set up uh, in our infusion centers and then have things available so that, you know, patients are, are well informed as to uh, what the therapy is going to be, you know, what costs may be associated with it and, and any follow-up that they may need as well. Um, so a number of those lab tests ahead of time, MRI scans, continual MRI scans, all of those are additional, you know, components with this therapy that are, are a little different than your traditional sort of oral tablet and capsule that you may get, you know, from the, the pharmacy uh, and you take it, you know, in an outpatient setting. So a number of those things, you know, give us a little more lead time to get started. I would say our, um, 
goal and, and anticipation at UW Health is really to begin you know, treating patients here in the fall coming up for Lucanamed. So making sure we have those things set up ahead of time so patients are, are ready to go and then uh, are well supported as they get into their infusion therapy. Thank you, really great comprehensive answer. And you set up the next question, which has to do with costs. So you started talking a little bit about that. So uh, Jack, I'll start with you and open it up to Cindy and Shaniqua as well. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of what we'd anticipate in terms of the cost associated with the, with the medication and the whole kit and caboodle of treatment? Yeah, yeah. so, and, and Dr. Carlson started out with, you know, this is a, a different therapy than the oral therapies that have been in the marketplace uh, for, for Alzheimer's patients. So it's in, infused therapy. Um, it's given uh, uh, every two weeks uh, for a total course of, of 18 months. Um, so when you factor that in, the dose range is, is based on weight, so it's a little variable depending on, on patient size as to, as to how much a patient may receive. But in general, for uh, a 12-month course, and knowing that we may treat patients for 18, it, it will cost a little more, but uh, for a 12-month course every two weeks, it's gonna be anywhere from twenty-five to $30,000 on an annual basis for a patient to receive that therapy. Um, you know, put that against what I described as Medicare covering 80%, and then there's a 20% portion there that, you know, patients would be responsible for uh, as part of that. That's just the drug therapy. So when we talk about the infusion therapy, you talk about the time to be in the infusion center. So the infusion typically lasts 60 minutes. Um, there are a number of uh, adjunct or additional therapies you may get to help with some things uh, called infusion reactions that patients may have. Most of those occur in the first you know, one to two infusions and may subside, but those are additional medications you're gonna receive on top of the infusion. Uh, and then you're gonna have time uh, there with the nursing staff that they'll be monitoring you or the physician staff. They'll be monitoring you not just for the 60 minutes you're getting the infusion, but then there's typically time after that that they're gonna watch and make sure things are, are okay before you, know, you leave the infusion center for the first couple infusions. And that time may you know, decrease over the 18 a month course, but um, those are all things that, that will continue. And that's just the infusion therapy. So then we talk about what do we continue to monitor? So the labs, the MRI scans, those are additional visits, additional follow-up. They'll also be part of the total cost of care for this infusion as, as we go forward. Great, Th yeah. thanks very much. I don't Cindy, should you anything else to add in terms of the cost side of things? No, I mean, it is, it's a lot more complex. I think Dr. Temple did a good job of describing it's, you know, we all see the, the Pharmacist putting the tablets into the, the pharmacy text, putting the tablets in the bottles. You know that's the pharmacy time, but the pharmacy time to mix and you know weigh it out, and the nursing time, and so all those costs add up on top of the drug costs. So it, it unfortunately is going to be expensive. It's through the veins. We're, we're all still working toward a pill. We'd love to have that, or at least shots you could do in your arm at home, like for insulin. Um, but we're just not there yet. So. It, I can chime in on the additional costs in regards to that pre-workup when you come into clinic because you have the costs incurred from the biomarkers, whether you have imaging done or you have one of the, the blood tests um, that we offer at the Fitchburg Clinic, which you'll have that one checks for amyloid as well as genotype. So you have that cost. They have a fee assistance program. Um, based on income to try to help with the incurred costs, but still out-of-pocket expenses, um, as well as imaging if you go for it with imaging for the pre-workup as well. And multiple visits also, because you have to have a pre-consultation to discuss the risks of the medication, um, meeting with one of the nurses in the clinic to go through everything, and then follow up to be triaged in clinic as well. So a lot of visits um, beforehand as well. Thank you. The, 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 oh, go ahead, in some ways, it's like when you go in for a cancer therapy, you, have a, you get blood tests and things to see which type of cancer is responsive to medicines. Um, you come in to check how your scans look and then come in for your chemotherapy for a certain period of time. So it's just take, having us take a shift in what we're used to, because we're used to being able to prescribe we have two groups of pills we can do, you try them, there's a few side effects, but it's just a shifting to, it's, it's gonna be more intensive therapy, more like you'd get in an oncology clinic, I think. That's such a great context, actually sets up a really good question I want to follow up with Dr. Temple with and then open it up to all of you as well. This really is a shift in the way we think about therapies and it's a shift that's been going on for a while now. There are a whole bunch of other 
antibody treatments, whether it's treatments for COVID or cancer or autoimmune diseases like Crohn's disease. So this is something that's already been happening. Uh, and this is the bit that Dr. Temple was teaching me about earlier, kind of the, could you kind of give us the bigger context here, sort of traditional drugs that are prescribed versus what we're calling biologics, this kind of this new model of treatment? Yeah, so um, as you mentioned, the FDA approval and um, the traditional drugs are, are oral tablets, capsules, things that we're, we're well aware of. Um, we do have some of those still in the drug pipeline, but I'd say a shift in the development of pharmaceuticals has really gone more to the biologic pathway. Um, so the FDA has two pathways, you know, drugs, oral drugs, biologic pathway that they make approvals. So a lot of these newer agents, the uh, monoclonal antibodies, gene therapies, others are, are moving through the biological pathways. Um, there's some acceleration in those pathways that the FDA does where they try to bring those products to market faster. So that's why you're also seeing some of these newer therapies um, move through the FDA much quicker. Uh, and we try to anticipate you know, when they're gonna get approval and when they may come you know, to market for, for treatment. But again, back, back to you know, your question, there has been the shift more to the biologic pathway. Uh, with that shift, a lot of these therapies, the monoclonal antibodies are either infused or we have some of them, as Dr. Carlson was describing, where we want to go, which are take-home self-injectable medications as well. So they are moving out of that traditional you know, oral and tablet pathway and, and more into the infusion therapy you know, and the, and the self-injectable therapy for take-home. And that's with the infusion therapy, you know, creates a little bit of a challenge as, as healthcare institutions, we're looking to make sure we have the right capacity and build capacity for infusions because each one of them is unique. Some are 30 minutes, some are 60 minutes, some are two hours, some have a lot of follow-up, some have less. And that all creates a little bit of a, a, a challenge in, in scheduling and making sure we have the right number of infusion chairs and capacity out there for the therapies that are coming to market. So that's a, a little bit of, of what you know, we go through and, and what we're looking at with the new drugs coming. Thank you. No, it's sort of exciting, it's exciting and daunting, you know, the way we're going to have to kind of change our practice of medicine to accommodate the, the new biologics. I don't know, Cindy, if Shaniqua, you had anything else to add in terms of kind of anticipating the biologics coming into clinical practice? It's just hard to get drugs into the brain. The brain doesn't like to get drugs into it. And so <laughs> as pharmacists know, um, it's really tough to get a pill to get into the brain. So I think we're looking at infusion therapies and or hopefully injectable therapies for a little while. Yeah, great. Um, Dr. Carlson, back to you. So uh, in the talk, you mentioned family history, genetics. You talked about APOE. How does that all intersect with the treatments that we're talking about? How does that kind of information help us with selecting or not selecting these treatments? It's a great question. So all of us get um, uh, two copies of this APOE gene, one from our biologic mom, one from our biologic dad. It can be either a two, three, or four. So I could have like a two and a three, or a three and a three, or a four and a three. The four is the one that increases our risk for getting dementia. So if I have a three and a four or a two and a four, my risk is elevated somewhat. If I have two copies of a four, my risk is increased even more. Um, so my risk is higher, but if I have an, one of those E4 alleles, I also have a higher risk of having those adverse side effects. So the swelling in the brain or the microbleeding. And I also, if I have two copies of that, if I have E44, so if I have two copies of that, my risk of having bleeding is even higher or side effects. And um, also, in some cases, you may not be eligible for the medication because it didn't show that it was a, as helpful in people with those with two copies of that. But again, the, having two copies is less common, so sometimes it's because studies don't have that many people who have two copies, so maybe it wasn't as effective, but if they have more people, maybe it'd be more effective. But um, some healthcare systems are not allowing people who have those E4 alleles to, so I know the VA healthcare system currently says that if you have ApoE44, the two, they don't wanna give you the infusion because they're not sure how helpful it'll be compared to the risk of having the side effects. So right now, it, it, it kind of tells what our risk is a little bit more. Um, it also tells us more about our risk for side effects. It might determine whether we'd get the infusion or not. We had a really uh, lovely question from one of the registrants. I'm gonna direct this to Dr. Bogues to start with. 
We are hearing more and more about the benefits of exercise, sleep, diet, and socializing on memory. How does that fit into our understanding of amyloid and tau and how people develop Alzheimer's? And so the implication is, could there be more quote unquote natural ways of addressing Alzheimer's disease? A great question, and I believe that ties into um, what Dr. Carlson said in regards to that holistic approach, uh, because diet, exercise, sleep, nutrition as well have significantly been shown to be um, beneficial for our brain health and help slow down that progression of cognitive impairment. Uh, exercise is protective to the brain and has a lot of great benefits, but also improves our vascular risk factors as well. So multiple benefits with exercise, multiple benefits with sleep as well, because sleep can impact our mood, impact our thinking, uh, increase our risk for infections and other contributors, which can affect memory. Uh, so definitely taking a holistic approach when thinking about brain health. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stick with, with Dr. Bogues. Uh, Dr. Bogues is a wonderful clinician. We have a number of patients in common, and you're, you're, Dr. Carlson's a wonderful clinician as well, of course. I don't work at the VA, so we don't have patients in common. But uh, so, uh, you know, I, I hear the clinician kind of coming through the, the, you know, the pragmatic person who's got to solve a problem in, in the clinic. So I'm going to share a problem that one of our registrants is having and see if you have any thoughts about it. We'll open it up as well. We are having trouble getting a diagnosis, presumably, of kind of what's causing memory loss. Most doctors just brush off memory issues without wanting to investigate, saying there isn't much we can do anyway. What's your advice for those in our situation? My advice for those who are concerned with their memory, uh, especially if you're having some challenges with your provider, it doesn't hurt to ask for a second opinion. Uh, you can ask for a cognitive screen just so you know and have a baseline, or ask for a referral to our memory diagnostic clinic, especially if you have a strong family history of dementia. Even if it's not anything significant, you at least would have that baseline um, so you know where to go from there. Uh, I'll open this up. I'm not sure exactly who to direct this to, but so tonight we've talked a lot about the anti-amyloid treatments. We've talked about the prior FDA-approved treatments. We haven't heard a lot about tau. So, like, what's going on with tau? Why don't we have any anti-tau treatments? Is there something in the pipeline there? What, what's cooking with that? So there are some. So partly why I showed you that big circle that has all those dots in there is because some of those dots are anti-tau therapies. So Thankfully, you know, they started with the amyloid because that's one that they figured out how to kind of target early on, and then now they're working towards um, tau therapies. And so we're actually being considered as a site to start um, a study to look at a tau ther anti-tau therapy for people who do have dementia or mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's. Um, but there are studies going on to look at that. There's studies that thankfully are looking at all kinds of things, so inflammation, the tau buildup, um, the vascular risk factors, like Dr. Bogues mentioned. So um, again, there's a kind of a widespread approach, because even though those graphs showed improvement, people aren't declining as much, they're still declining, and we want to get those curves flat so people don't decline. Um, we're going to peek behind the curtain here of UW Health. and, and you know, we're talking about all the various different biologics that are available, and there's you know, tons of new stuff in the cancer world, in this world, et cetera. How do you think about, you know, how we evaluate these? How does, like, a healthcare system figure out what are we going to do with these different agents? Do we approve, you know, there's, there's something called the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee that figures out what we're actually going to have at the hospital. How does all that work? How do you sort through all that information? Yeah. So at, at UW Health, we, we do have our, our pharmacy and therapy committee. Uh, as part of that committee, we, it's interdisciplinary. We have many of our, our specialists and clinicians uh, from the medical staff that join us. Uh, we have individuals from the pharmacy staff as well. Um, the pharmacy staff really, really do a job ahead of, of, as I described, monitoring new drugs in the pipeline, uh, anticipated uh, approval dates. 
Uh, and as part of that monitoring, we do like to start early on with our specialists and clinicians to sort of have a conversation of when we think something may be approved, uh, have a perspective from them about where it fits into the treatment um, pathways for patients, um, how many patients may be impacted, uh, all in anticipation of when that approval happens. And when it does, then we also have a formal process where our, our specialists will request addition to formulary. That really gets the ball rolling for us. That starts the full evaluation because each therapy that comes to market, um, you saw some of the studies and results from Dr. Carlson. Uh, our team evaluates those. They also put together an objective um, review of that, present that to uh, the clinicians, and then that, that uh, pharmacy and therapeutics committee really votes on you know, the approval of adding that drug to market. Um, all that to say, yeah, there, there's two kind of distinct pathways we're working under though uh, within a healthcare system. So we have our acute care hospital patients um, that come to us, they're in a hospital bed. Uh, we utilize our formulary for treatment pathways for many of those patients and the therapies we use. But now we're also seeing, as we talked about, this shift of therapy to the outpatient setting. And that brings in a, a little bit of a different you know, twist because uh, that care is um, you know, paid for or, or provided in an outpatient setting. Uh, reimbursement or uh, ability to provide therapy is different than we do on the acute care side. Um, so we have, to, we have to really track what is going on with the payers in the marketplace, uh, whether it's Medicare, whether it's commercial insurance, um, how are they looking at those therapies as well? Because they are also driving patient access within the outpatient setting, whether it's our clinic and infusion center or whether it's a patient that goes to a physician office. Many times they'll have to take steps to get those approvals and make sure that therapy is available in the outpatient setting. So we, we've now built some controls around that and our controls are really to protect the patient. We wanna make sure that they know what's involved with the therapy, uh, what financially may be required, uh, many insurances also require prior, prior authorizations. So we want to make sure those steps are taken so patients don't get surprised with um, a bill uh, when they may or may not have expected it. And we also want to make sure they have access. And so there are many other programs that we know about, uh, whether they're from the manufacturer, whether they're patient assistance programs, that we can also make sure patients track into. So they're, they're getting access to that therapy when they, they may or may not have had, have had, have had access before. So yeah, that's a little peek behind the curtain and, and we do evaluate those therapies and, and really make the independent approval of whether or not we're gonna provide that therapy to patients. Thank you. Yeah. We are getting close to the end of our panel discussion. We're gonna open things up to all of you in terms of questions from the audience. Um, so uh, as we prepare that process, I want you all to think about I apologize for springing on this on you in the last minute here, just thought of this. Maybe like one final take home point that each of you would like to emphasize to our audience about really anything that, that we've, we've covered here tonight, whether it's the diagnosis side or the therapy side or the logistics or whatever. So some, something that you believe would be really important for our audience to, uh, to take home with them tonight. So, I'm gonna give you a few seconds to mull that over. Uh, I wanna encourage folks to now start submitting your questions. If you've got, I see some folks, yep, there you go, just raise your hands. Our staff will come by and pick them up and then that's gonna, those are gonna to start to get streamed in our direction as well and then we'll get into, into the Q&A. So who wants to go first with your, uh, who wants to go first with your words of wisdom? I guess I'll start. Um, again, I think we're at a really exciting time. I think one of the slides I showed with the old medicine, um, I showed it for so many years, I started showing at the bottom how many years I've been showing it, because we had no new therapies for 20 years. Menemenda was approved 20 years ago this year. Um, so to have no new therapies, and then now to have some therapies that actually get at the root cause of the disease, we're really excited about that. Again, it's just a start. It's not gonna help people go back to where they were. But there are other things too, and if we have to pick one of those modifiable risk factors to focus on, if everyone in the room can really focus on your blood pressure control, that would have a huge impact on your thinking abilities, your risk for dementia. Um, we know in certain populations, especially African-American men, um, in certain groups of people who have side effects from high blood pressure, if you control your blood pressure, it'll help your brain health. So there's lots of things we can do. They're not always easy. I know it's easier to take a 
in some ways it's easier to take a pill than to do all the things we know are good for us, exercise and um, control our blood pressure and things like that. But um, so again, we're super excited about where we are. We're not done yet, we need more research, but there's things we can do in the meantime. Thank you. I would just like to chime in on that as well, focusing on your overall health, staying active, and uh, keeping in mind that our best medicine is our food. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think for me, um, just important to know that you know, at UW Health, we're, we're really interested in, in providing the cutting edge therapies and, and work closely with um, the medical school and the research arm. Um, to really help patients transition from the research aspect really to the clinical care aspect. But in doing that, I would say um, do a, a lot of, of research and understanding, ask a lot of questions up front about how you can get access to and how you can continue to, to maintain therapy and what, what you should expect from it. Um, did a little looking, I know there are a lot of resources out there, um, but as you're, as you're working with um, your specialist, uh, have them reach out. We have a number of wraparound services at UW Health um, to get access to those so that you're, you're educated and, and have the knowledge to really um, know what you're stepping into and, and what options you have to as well. Because there are a number of them out there and we can definitely get you connected to the, to the right option to make sure you're able to access the therapy that you need. Thank you very much. All right. We have a very lively audience. We have many, many questions here. So we won't have time to get to everyone's questions. We are going to post questions and answers on the website. So if your particular question isn't answered, please check back on the website and we will hope to, to get it. So we're gonna just dive right on in here. Thank you, Dr. Edwards and her colleagues for helping sort through these questions. So here's a terrific question. Um, my dad, age 81, has hearing loss and dementia. I have hearing loss, I'm worried. Can you expand on the relationship between hearing loss and dementia? Great question, because definitely staying in tune with the sensory aspect of things as well, because hearing can impact memory, because we can't expect individuals to remember what they can't hear. So we definitely make sure um, you get hearing aids if that would be beneficial for them. I don't think it necessarily means if you have hearing loss that you will get dementia, but as Dr. Bogue said, if you do have hearing loss to wear hearing aids, um, your partner will appreciate it, your spouse will appreciate it more, <laughs> your children will appreciate it. But it does, it, it, it does help with, with it, um, getting information in. And we do have a study that's starting up. Dr. Kim Mueller will be working on a study looking at impact of hearing aids on cognition. So. There's, if, if I may add, so there's uh, every few years in a journal called The Lancet, there's an article published that looks at risk factors for developing Alzheimer's disease. It's a lovely S-shaped curve that shows the modifiable, meaning you can fix them, and non-modifiable risk factors like age. And midlife hearing loss is one of those clear risk factors for the later development of dementia. So just a, a plug for screening for and addressing hearing loss is something that could maybe reduce the risk of developing dementia down the line. Here's another one of those, like, are these, how are these things related kind of questions. Alzheimer's disease is often referred to as type 3 diabetes. What research, just so folks know, so there's type 1 diabetes, that's an autoimmune disorder, arises earlier in life. Type 2 diabetes is the kind of more common form of diabetes. And Colloquially and formally, Alzheimer's has been called type 3 diabetes. What research is being conducted to examine the incidence of metabolic syndrome in Alzheimer's, in particular in underrepresented populations? Put simply, is obesity strongly correlated to Alzheimer's disease? Uh. I think that factors into looking at that holistic approach as well because all of those things tie in. Um, obesity will factor in because it's gonna increase your risk for diabetes, can also increase your risk for sleep apnea, which can increase your risk for Alzheimer's disease as well as vascular disease. So just a whole vicious cycle where it all factors into not only Alzheimer's disease, but potentially vascular dementia as well. Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, so the, um, 
Oh, but there is hope for all of those things too, though. So even though there's this vicious cycle, there's evidence that it, does, it no, no matter how late you start like walking or exercising or addressing those vascular risk factors, that it does help. Um, type three diabetes in the brain, again, we do have some research team members. Dr. Barbara Benlin is doing some work on how does insulin resistance and that affect brain health. Um, we have their other colleagues as well to try to better understand how does, um, why our brain doesn't use sugar properly, glucose, and um, how that affects our brain health. Thank you. Um, so there's a lot to kind of untangle in this next one, but it, it's a nice follow-up to the idea that uh, we are getting better and better diagnostic markers of the illness. And so it really gets to the question of how soon, how early does one test? I'll just read the question. I have a parent who died with Alzheimer's disease. I'm guessing I may have a precursor to Alzheimer's disease. I don't feel I have symptoms now. What are the pros and cons of being tested now? Um, right now, um, there's no therapies that have been shown to prevent Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we do have um, prevention trials going on right now. So people who are interested, um, I know we have some information about something called the APT website, which gets you into kind of a pre-clinical trial. And anyway, so there's some pipelines to get people in line to study some of these new exciting therapies. But right now, those therapies aren't FDA approved, and they won't be FDA approved till these studies get finished. And so that's a little plug that for people who are interested in doing something about it for themselves, their families, um, getting involved with research is what you can do right now. If I got a test today and it showed that I had elevated amyloid in my brain, there's nothing I can do right now because I can't get the lecanemab therapy until it's approved for people without symptoms. Um, all that I could do would have that information and exercise harder, you know, try to eat healthier, like Dr. Bogues mentioned, you know, eat um, healthy foods, but that's what I could do right now. So that's why we don't recommend getting it, the, any testing, unless you're going to be part of some research to help us learn what's the best way to approach that. Thank you. Um, so we did have, I, I, I think this question maybe illustrates that um, there's a lot of new terms, new words, difficult to pronounce words like, like flicanumab and denanumab and so on. So maybe, maybe just kind of a quick refresher on, so there's aticanumab, lecanumab, denanumab. How are these different from each other? Like what's the take home about what, you know, what, what these three drugs actually are and how, how they're different from each other? Yeah, well, <laughs> the, the, the take home for sure is all of them are, are monoclonal antibodies. And, and, and by design then they are targeting um, some of the, the antibodies that are produced within the body themselves. And so each one, depending on the marker they're going after, um, will be designed biologically to, you know, go after that target and, and treat that therapy from, uh, from an antibody standpoint. Um, when you see MAB at the end, that's where you know you've, you've transitioned into the biologic and the monoclonal antibody. So in that essence, they're, they're all that type of biologic therapy as we go forward. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Com kind of complex question here. I'll try to unpack this a little bit. What is the outlook for people with pre-existing conditions like mental illness, other uh, intellectual disability, brain injury, uh, who then are at risk of developing dementia or do develop dementia? Are those folks eligible or ineligible for research participation or getting access to other treatments? Uh, and also noting that there's a lot of intersection between those populations and underserved populations, racial, ethnic minorities, so then you got kind of a double whammy in terms of access. So um, how do we ensure that folks who have a wide variety of potential risk factors for dementia are included in the studies? It's a great question. Again, that's what a lot of the critiques are of prior clinical trials, is that they'd only recruit really healthy people who are highly functional into these studies and then if you have a person, you know, I, I do clinical practice at the VA hospital and, you know, some of my veterans have had traumatic brain injury or other, um, you know, and some of them have had learning disabilities or other things and maybe they weren't included in these clinical trials. So then how do I know if these therapies work for them? But one thing we do, and I'm sure Dr. Vokes can speak to this too, is we try to outline what are the things we can do for each condition. So 
for the traumatic brain injury, maybe we can't do anything, but learning disabilities, can we, is there something we can help that person with? If there's another contributing factor, ADHD or other conditions, can we treat that in addition to um, trying to treat the underlying dementia if there is one? So breaking down what the causes are to their cognitive symptoms and treating those. But the clinical trials are trying to include more people with different conditions, but the challenging part is, it, let's say if somebody has um, uh, one condition that affects their memory and then they also have Alzheimer's, sometimes it makes it confusing if, if one condition gets worse, if it's the Alzheimer's or that condition. So then sometimes there are some people who are excluded from studies. So um, it, it's, they're trying to open it up so more people with different conditions can be a part of these studies. But again, there are some limitations on how open they can have it be. And if you want to add anything else to I was just going to add, too, that um, in this case, put a plug in for the post-marketing clinical trials that are out there as well, because um, as Dr. Carlson said, you know, the studies are coming out. They want to have a controlled fashion so that they really um, can describe the benefit that the therapy is, is achieving. Um, that does limit sometimes the patient populations, but as we have post-marketing clinical trials or we actually have experience that, that um, literature and that uh, information is going to emerge over time will allow us to continue to build and understand how, you know, how different populations are affected. But I would say definitely consider, uh, if you haven't, those post-marketing clinical trials because that continues to broaden the patient population and our understanding of how it affects different ethnicities and races across the board. Well, that's such a great, that's a great, great point. So post-marketing trial. And Cindy, you had in your slide phase one, phase two, phase three. So maybe we could just spend a minute talking about, I mean, it's a huge enterprise getting a molecule or a compound from the lab to people. So maybe, maybe Jack, you could tell, you know, what is phase one, phase two, phase three, but what are these different stages yeah. of testing drugs? Yeah, di different stages. Phase one, very early on, um, development, uh, bench development, maybe uh, some anim animal models or, or other uh, cell models they go, they get into phase through, phase two, or their smaller um, you know, human studies and, and emerge to the larger phase three trials to which they conduct before they go through the actual FDA application or the BLA application to the FDA for approval. Once they get the approval, that's where the post-marketing trials come in. And a lot of times now with these newer therapies that I've described being on an accelerated pathway, the FDA and that acceleration doesn't allow all of the advanced or the, the large studies that we've had in the past with some of our uh, hypertension medications or diabetes medications that have come out. And so you do have much smaller populations and with that comes some risk in that approval because we don't have answers to all the questions. I mean, Dr. Carlson had a number of questions that are still outstanding. Again, those are what we're surveilling and what we're monitoring in that post-marketing clinical trial era. And just to sort of tie this together, you know, with, with Adjuhelm, uh, as it was first approved, was controversial, it remained an investigative therapy in the marketplace, and so many did not cover that for patient infusion, which really, I would say, stalled its uptake. But with lecanemab and denanemab, uh, much better uptake and, and outcomes that we're seeing, so those will continue to progress in the therapy marketplace. Thank you for I mean, that's such a great point about you know, all the various steps that go into getting drugs to market and then stuff still happens afterward. And so we're continue, continue to study the medications after they come out to help answer some of these questions that you all are asking. Good. Okay, so another question around um, making sure that the work that we're doing is inclusive. Uh, what about uh, other aspects of diversity like gender, sexual orientation, and gender I identity. So, so we probably know, know the most about gender in, in terms of Alzheimer's research, uh, but uh, what all would you say in terms of gender, sexual orientation, gender identity in terms of uh, our understanding of Alzheimer's disease and getting people to studies as well? Yes, yeah, so I think as far as um, gender, um, as far as um, you know, in the past, there have been studies that show that women tend to have more Alzheimer's risk than men. And then there are some studies showing, well, maybe that's just because women live longer for a variety of reasons. Um, and so is it really that they're at higher risk or they're living longer and age is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease? 
Um, Dr. Asana, our leader, has done a lot of work with hormone therapies um, in persons and seeing what does a hormone therapy do for a person's risk for dementia. Now, with, with persons who've had, who maybe were born biologically male and became female, you know, we've had patients in clinic where you're trying to sort out, um, you know, with their memory decline, is there anything contributing from their hormone therapy, their, you know, either direction, if they had, um, if they had, um, you know, were born biologic male or born biologic female and switched. So again, there's a lot of research that needs to be done to better understand you know, right now there's there's different types of hormone therapy studies, and we're still doing hormone therapy studies at Wisconsin, um, but trying to understand not only how do these hormones work in different sexes, but in people who are trans transgender. Um, so there's still a lot of unknowns that are done, but there's a lot of research being done around hormone therapies, um, and then how that interacts with these other types of risk factors that we've talked about. And if you all want to add anything. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we're at 710, we're running to 725, so we do have time for, I've got one question here, we do have time for a few additional questions for staff if there's anything else that, uh, that, that you all would like to hear about. So I'm going to start with this specific question, but make it a more general question. So what is the current research on effects of the proton pump inhibitor class of medications on dementia and Alzheimer's risk? And then I think the general question is, are there categories of medications that we worry about in terms of increasing the, the, the risk of, of dementia? And whoever takes this, please explain what a proton pump inhibitor is as well. Our pharmacists explain what a proton right, pump a, inhibitor is. What's a, what is a proton pump inhibitor? <laughs> well, those, those are the uh, uh, famous um, GI medications to help reduce uh, gastro reflux and, and heartburn. Uh, you may know them as uh, Prilosec, Nexium um, in the marketplace, uh, but they, they actually reduce the uh, proton pump inhibition within the stomach, reduce the amount of, of acid that um, is released in the stomach uh, when you're uh, either eating or throughout the day. And so that's where the proton pump inhibition comes in uh, for it. Now, I may turn it over to Dr. Carlson or others for um, some of the connections or, or any of the other risk factors that go along with, with that on, on the Alzheimer's side. I know there are some studies showing that there may be a slight increased risk of dementia with things like omeprazole use. Um, I don't know, Dr. Bokes, have you been, I haven't been necessarily stopping people's proton pump inhibitors in general. I don't know what your practice has been or if you know of any of their studies. I haven't been stopping them either, but making sure their vitamin levels are where they need to be also in their bone mineral density. I know there are some other studies, but we're not studying that here right now, but those are good questions, because those are, especially with medicines that we do take a lot in common. So, and is that kind of getting to your next question about other? Yeah, I mean, so, um, well, let me, before we get to that, what about statins? I get, the, I know, I'm sure you get this both asked all the time. I get it asked to, uh, you know, do statins, so medications to lower cholesterol. What's their impact? Could they increase my risk of dementia? What's the trade-off between that and then lowering my cholesterol and that reducing the risk of dementia? So they do not increase your risk of dementia. So this is one area I studied for years, um, looking at the effects of statins on cognition um, and people at risk for dementia. Um, there have been lots of very large scale clinical trials with statins that did not show that it caused any increased risk for dementia. There was a warning put on them by the FDA based on some anecdotes, um, but not really based on large scale studies. Um, but each of us are different, so, you know, I've had patients who have a certain side effect, um, there's a certain side effect listed on a medication, and my patients will have the opposite side effect, and, you know, you're kind of, so each of us are individually different, but again, um, by taking statins and reducing your risk for cardiovascular disease, stroke, um, the risk of not being on a statin, if you should be on one, is, is worse. So if you're prescribed a statin, it should be for cardiovascular reasons, you know, um, stroke prevention reasons, not for Alzheimer's prevention reasons, but um, I would recommend you stay on that. So what categories should we be worried about? Like, you know, as clinicians, you look at the med list, 
what do you, jumps out at you as like, oh my goodness, this could be an issue in terms of the person's memory loss? <laughs> a lot of them. <laughs> I, just to add, I mean, when you look at, as you described, I mean, each, each person is individual, um, the impacts that the medications may have. I think th there's always um, side effects or things that you could point to. I think when you evaluate, you know, therapies and, and patients that are come in that are on 15, 20 different medications, you're always going to run through their medication list. You're going to identify probably two or three medications that probably could could be causing uh, what you're you know looking into. I think at times it's best to to stop one at a time and understand what is the impact to really determine is that is that the cause or not. Um, so it does get it does get complex. And, and when we talk about you know patients, I just reminded it's a, it's a good plug to put in around compliance with medications, particularly when you talk about some of the other um, disease states, whether it's hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, obesity, all of those have uh, medications that are used to treat or, or lower, uh, or positive outcomes, lower your, your comorbidities. Um, compliance is a big one. Um, over 30% of prescriptions written are never picked up at the pharmacy. And so as a statistic, you know, you could see that uh, when physicians are working with patients, and they prescribe a therapy, but yet um, it's not acted upon, or it's not taken, or it's not picked up, and you can't really continue to reduce those comorbidities and the things that are having, and, and diabetes being one. Uh, number, of new, number of new therapies, number of self-injectables, monoclonals on the market for diabetes treatment, um, probably can be positive both on the obesity side, lowering your uh, blood pressure, uh, keeping your diabetes under control, all can help in the long run as you look at that compliance for patients. That statistic is astonishing. You heard the audience gasp. Now I know why 30% of my patients don't get better. <laughs> I just need to go pick up their medication. Thank you for that. That's a great point. Dr. Dr. Bogues is one of the best clinicians I've ever met. So um, how do you approach that with your patients? How do you approach like stopping medicines? That... Uh, taking off one medication at a time and following up with them to see how they're doing. But also adding not just medications that's prescribed, but also being careful with vitamins. Because I've seen some patients who take too many vitamins and duplicate um, vitamins as well. So a multivitamin A and you're taking a, a, a B12 and a B complex, it's just double dipping basically with the vitamins. So being careful with vitamins as well. Anything with PM at the end of it, so Tylenol PM, Advil PM. It's the Benadryl, so anything that's drying, like um, antihistamines, anything to slow down diarrhea, things to slow down urinary incontinence, some of those have some negative effects on cognition. So, um, you know, as has been mentioned, just always going slow, working with your doctor, starting with one thing at a time, but you know, we, it's really helpful to de-prescribe and not just prescribe, so cutting down the medicine list. Well, and Dr. Carlson, you had that, that great graphic showing how the kind of first generation of medications like denepazil help with neurotransmitters. So that neurotransmitter is acetylcholine, and lots of medications are anticholinergic. They like the PM medications that you mentioned. So that's one of the things we look at carefully on the medication list is what medications could actually be blocking the brain hormone that's responsible for attention and memory, and then carefully getting rid of those medications. Yeah. Okay, I think we've covered that, that topic pretty extensively. Um, this is a fun one. I have not heard this before, so I'm, I'm curious as to the answer. I recently heard there may be a connection between diet soda and memory issues. Is that true? <laughs> the panel is stumped. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the diet sodas have different compounds in them, so aspartame, um, um, saccharin, and prior ones. Um, I don't know if they have formal studies showing any memory changes, but um, I don't know. What about those aluminum cans that the soda is in? Not aluminum, thankfully, has been disproven. <laughs> So people can use deodorants, aluminum pans, and all that. Um, that thankfully has been disproven. Okay. Um, so this is a really interesting question, and I don't know that we, we have an answer to this. 
Um, it's about the link between pre-existing mental illness and Alzheimer's disease. My mom had early onset Alzheimer's. I have ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Has research been done looking at the relationship between Alzheimer's and ADHD and relationship between Alzheimer's and medications for ADHD like the stimulants? I'm embarrassed to say I'm a geriatrist. I don't know the answer to that question. We should have Dr. Right. <laughs> Wallace to answer this. I mean, I think on the stimulant side, so there's a very, so the medications for ADHD that are most commonly used are stimulants like Ritalin or methylphenidate, Adderall, which are amphetamine salts, and they work really well. They're very effective medications and they can have pretty significant side effects that are relevant to people as they age. They can increase heart rate, increase blood pressure, there might be an increased risk of arrhythmia where the heart doesn't beat properly, and maybe even stroke. And so that's where the, the trade-off gets complicated. Um, I've diagnosed a number of patients late in life with ADHD, they were never picked up as having ADHD earlier in life, which is sort of sad, like what would things look like if they had been treated at age 15 and 25 and so on with ADHD. But that doesn't automatically mean they'll get a stimulant because of the potential downsides of the, uh, of the stimulant. But I'm embarrassed to say I don't know what the literature is around the risk between ADHD itself and, and Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, I don't know either. I think, um, I don't think there is as much out there on that, con on that condition, but one thing that's exciting is that the Alzheimer's Centers program that Dr. Aslana mentioned, um, we're changing some of the data that we're collecting so we can better understand some of these conditions like depression, ADHD, other of these mental health conditions. And if, if we start with those, how does that increase our risk or change our risk for developing dementia from a variety of causes? So we're trying to study that better at a national level um, but again, it does, you know, if someone has attention deficit disorder and they're doing a thinking test, they may not be able to pay attention as well and it can affect the thinking test. And so hopefully, the, usually the people giving the test have a, are in tune to that and say, oh, I think this is the ADHD, not necessarily a dementia process. It's just your attention has changed. So, um, so I think there's progress being made, but I still, we still don't have an answer. And I, I will say, so a number of other mental health conditions like major depression, bipolar illness, schizophrenia, they have been associated with an increased risk of dementia for a variety of different reasons. And there are more and more older adults with those conditions as well. So that's something else that's of interest as well, trying to help folks with pre-existing depression, bipolar, and so on address dementia. All right, one last question here. So this gets, uh, this actually sort of gets to one of the not yet completely understood parts of treatment with the new monoclonal antibodies, the, the duration. The specific question was, can you, could, should you go past 18 months to 24 months for aducanumab? But that really brings up the broader question of, kind of what do we know about kind of once someone is on these treatments, when sh how long should they go on? When should the treatments be stopped? And recognize we're very early days on that, but any preliminary thoughts on how long these treatments will actually go on for? I, I would say, yeah, it, it's very early on, so I don't know that there's an answer to that question. I think one of the things we have seen at times with monoclonal antibodies and, and the treatment too as well is even after your last infusion, there is uh, sometimes prolonged effect on the reduction of the antibodies within your, your, your body uh, from that treatment. And that, that period of time varies depending on the medication and, and how it works and, and the dose you receive. But um, I, yeah, I think there's still a lot to be determined um, past that, that 18 months. And again, we're at 18 months because that was the accelerated approval. That was the marker which showed benefit and the FDA wanted to make sure the therapy was there for patients. So again, sort of goes back to, it's going to continue to evolve at 24 months, at 36 months, we'll continue as patients get to those markers. We'll probably likely see data and information that comes out about you know what is occurring in those patients that received that treatment and whether it stopped and did the amyloid levels begin to rise back and did that even show an impact clinically or not in where they were in their, their cognition or, or memory as well? 
So I think more, more to come, at least from my standpoint. <laughs> I agree. I think that, um, you know, there, there's, it takes decades for that amyloid to build up in our brain. So by the time these participants got done with the study, their levels were down below where they'd be told they have elevated amyloid anymore. They're, they don't have elevated amyloid anymore. And so if they were going to try out for a trial at that point, they'd say you're not eligible because you don't have enough amyloid in your brain. So again, the amyloid's been reduced to a point this low, and is it going to take decades to accumulate again or not? We don't know. And, but there's some damage that's probably already been triggered. I mean, there's, the amyloid's been sitting there, probably irritating the brain. And we don't know if those side effects are going to continue um, or if it has to, you know, if things will continue to get better until the amyloid reaccumulates. So a lot of unanswered questions. But thankfully, they have the, now as we have all learned, post-marketing studies to um, help us answer those questions. Thank you. Well, we have come to the end of our evening. I want to express my very deep gratitude to our wonderful UW, UW Health experts and colleagues, Dr. Carlson, Dr. Bogues, Dr. Temple. Thank you very much. Well, uh, moderator, Dr. Wallace X, we really want to thank him. And our signers, I want to thank them. They've done yes. such a wonderful job tonight. I very much want to thank our staff as well who followed through on the vision for the comfy chairs and the ferns. I think you'll agree that it fostered a sparkling conversation to be in such a comfortable setting. So thank you, staff, as well. All right, I want to remind all of you in the audience to please complete the evaluations. Those are the yellow forms. Uh, we'll be picking those up on the way out. Thank you all again for your great questions, for attending the event. The Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center provides this annual event as a way to give back to the Madison community and our research participants. We want you to know what is happening in the field of Alzheimer's research here in Wisconsin across the country. We were, reported, we were optimistic, I think you got that sense today, about our future. Please stay involved and in touch with our center, volunteer for our research studies, attend our events, listen to our awesome Dementia Matters podcast. Dr. Nate Chin, the host of that incredible podcast, is here. Reach out to us about other ways that you can get involved. Again, this event is recorded, and you'll be able to watch it again via YouTube. Thank you all. Oh, I'm sorry. And question, thank you, Dr. Edwards. Uh, questions will be posted online along with the answers as well. So thank you all. Have a great night.